Thank you for that. Well deserved. Next item on our agenda is the 645 discussion with State Rep uh, Julian Sear, State Rep Tim Whalen, and Will Crocker. I don't see Will, but if you want to come forward, that'd be great. Representative Crocker will not be joining us tonight. Okay. Will not. He had a, a family emergency to attend. Okay. Sorry to hear that. He sends his apologies and his regards, but it was truly, uh, I spoke, he just can't be here because of the emergency. Understood. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Congratulations on your. Uh, Chairwoman's position, Madam Chairwoman. Yes, Chairman, yeah, thank you. You certainly worked hard. You deserve it. Thank you, Tim. So um, I don't know if there was um, a, f uh, a formal uh, agenda type of thing sure. for us. So what I thought we would do by start by allowing the two of you to talk about the things that you've been working on, and then having uh, uh, some questions, and maybe the board can ask some questions. But sure. Just feel free to um, go ahead. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna defer to the local man here <laughs> as a uh, a, a person uh, who lives on on the Outer Cape. But uh, it's great to uh, be with all of you. Um, congratulations for those of you uh, who are new uh, and returning. Uh, and congratulations, Tracy. Uh, Congratulations to you as Thank well. You. I don't think a you've little been condolences here. as well. Uh, it's a lot of work <laughs> That's involved. That's what I usually say um, to people. But we've actually been doing the rounds. Uh, visiting um, a, a number of our boards uh, and wanting to do more of that. Um, but actually, I think Yarmouth is the first that we're starting uh, in, in sort of a, a tour that, that we're trying to do in our delegation, going to all the, uh, I think now I represent 21 communities in the Cape and Islands District, uh, you know, ideally with our partners. In Yarmouth, I have two great partners um, in both uh, Representative Whalen and Representative Crocker. Uh, so take it away, Tim, and then. Uh, sure. Uh, in, in my congratulations, I'd also like to extend congratulations to Selectman Forrest on your, uh, your great win and um, you welcome on this board and we're looking forward to working alongside of you as we love working with every other member of this board of Selectmen and all the Selectmen uh, and Councilors across the Cape. Uh, I would say that um, probably the issue that I've been working on, and it's not really so much on a local issue, it's more of a statewide issue that I've been working um, on that's really been absorbing a lot of time over the past several weeks, but it certainly um, does affect right, right here in Yarmouth uh, because it affects the addiction issue. It's been a bill that I recently co-filed with a, a good friend of mine from across the aisle, so it's a bipartisan bill. Uh, Representative Paul Tucker is a Democrat from Salem. He's also the retired chief of police in Salem. We filed a bill to regulate car fentanyl. Uh, carfentanil has been covered um, quite a bit in the media, and it's also known as an elephant tranquilizer. As dangerous as we recognize heroin is. And then further, uh, two years ago when we established new regulations relating to trafficking of fentanyl, which is uh, 50 times to 100 times more potent than heroin, we find now again that there's a new devil knocking at our door, and that devil's name is carfentanil. Uh, carfentanil is so potent that um, it is 50 to 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Uh, the amount that would be considered enough to cause a fatal overdose in a human being is measured in micrograms. As a matter of fact, it's 20 micrograms. Uh, it's being sold at $2,000 a kilo by uh, certain interests um, in Asia and being brought to this country, and it's being mixed. Quite often when this is mixed with a cutting agent, um, be it uh, inositol or uh, vitamin B, it's not mixed in what we would consider pharmaceutical conditions. It's mixed in coffee grinders. As a result, it's caused uh, overdose deaths across the country, and we find that those deaths, as we follow the trail, they're coming right here. Now in New England, where uh, there, there's a uh, record of carfentanil overdoses in Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and Maine, and recently there was a case that was well reported in the media of a police officer who was just dusting a couple of grains of carfentanil off of his uniform. And just what he absorbed transdermally through his skin was enough uh, to cause him to go into overdose, and he had to be administered Narcan four times in order to save his life. Um, here's the mind-bending part, carfentanil. It's not named as a controlled substance in the Massachusetts general laws. It's not prohibited. It's not named as a substance in Chapter 94C. So in filing this bill, which I have uh, the Cape and Islands delegation signed on in support of as well, we have 64 co-sponsors. What we're looking to do is we're looking to make this substance illegal and also assign uh, trafficking, um, trafficking penalties to it, which would be up to 20 years in prison. So that would be probably the, the one thing that uh, I've been dealing with legislatively. Uh, also, we've been dealing with the state budget. 
We've been chipping away at the state budget. We passed through on the House side, I believe it was $40.2 billion. Um, we got through that in April before passing it off to our good and hardworking colleagues in the Senate, um, which they just recently got through. And um, in there, we, uh, I was able to include um, a couple of um, earmarks, one in particular that would increase uh, services to veterans through the Veterans Outreach Centers, including the Cape and Islands Veterans Outreach Center in Hyannis, which serves veterans from all over the Cape, including here in Yarmouth. So uh, we were able to uh, increase their budget um, in the line item by $1.2 million. Um, we also got through a $200 million Chapter 90 bond bill to ensure that the state lives up to its obligations to provide the municipalities with the funds that they're going to need to help with the maintenance of the roads. And um, we are also uh, had, uh, I would call it a, a market increase, but certainly not market enough in um, Chapter 70 funding, the per pupil, uh, the increase that we had per pupil in Chapter 70 funding um, in that line item as well through DESE. So we still have an awful lot of work ahead of us. As we know, there's a tremendous, tremendous disparity in what our Cape Towns, what our school districts and our, uh, um, uh, our vocational schools are receiving for a percentage of funding from the state versus what they're receiving in other places. That's, that's an issue that's going to be very, very difficult for us to resolve based upon the, num uh, the numbers of representatives and senators that we have from down here in our part of the state versus more urban areas with a you know, uh, more concentrated population. There it's just a numbers game. So I believe that um, speaking on behalf of uh, the, the Cape and Islands delegation, we continue to work together very closely together to try and find new ways and new parts of money that are out there that we can um, try and bring back to our school districts to help lighten the load to our local taxpayers. I know the senator works very, very hard and works very closely with the, uh, with, um, the superintendents, the school superintendents throughout the Cape, as do I, uh, as does Rep. Crocker. And um, it's through this level of communication that we have and the understanding and the, 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 the shared knowledge that we have uh, that we're able to find um, where the needs are and to try and, you know, dig up a few more bucks here or there to try and help out our schools. DY has certainly had many challenges going forward. I've known this when my wife was an employee here in the DY school district. And um, also since I've been in office and working with you hardworking folks here in Yarmouth as well as in Dennis to try and find some answers to the funding issues um, affecting the schools. But um, we're, we're not quite there yet, but again, we are trying our very best and just dealing with the realities of what it is up in Boston. Uh, I think we're doing a pretty good job of trying to find little bits of money and returning them back here to the home district. Yeah. Senator. Uh, thank you, Representative. Um, I would just echo, I, I think, the collaborative nature of the work that this delegation does um, has been uh, so wonderful, so welcoming. Uh, I think for me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going into my sixth month in this position. Uh, really so refreshing, I think, given the, the tenor of our and turbulence in our national politics. And that's just something I'm, I'm really grateful for. And I'm learning a lot from uh, members of the delegation uh, who've, who've had a few years under their belt. Uh, and, and Will Crocker and I are both working hard to, to catch up. Um, so we've been uh, pretty, pretty busy since starting in January, uh, fi brought on a staff of five individuals, all of who are uh, Cape Cod natives uh, or who live here. That was something that was very important to me. Uh, we filed uh, 27 bills. Uh, in January, ranging from uh, initiatives to help uh, young folks uh, afford home ownership, uh, giving towns control over uh, spraying on power lines, uh, making sure that uh, Entergy, the utility that owns Pilgrim Nuclear Power Station, uh, maintains their commitment uh, to our communities and to the state uh, once they close, uh, taking initiatives to help uh, keep elders in their homes, uh, and a whole host of other initiatives. Um, that, that we've been looking at in uh, a pretty uh, sort of a aggressive legislative agenda. Um, we've also been very mindful to make sure that we're continuing to engage the public. Uh, we had a policy summit early this spring uh, with about 200 stakeholders, uh, and we sort of want to make sure that we're doing a good job uh, bringing people together, convening, uh, getting all the good ideas that we can to address uh, the big challenges the region faces. Uh, I'm, I'm, I feel very fortunate for the committee assignments uh, that the Senate President uh, gave me. I chair the Community Development and Small Business Committee. Uh, so this is the committee where all issues of planning, zoning, uh, and small business go to. Uh, so it's a, as someone who grew up in a, a seasonal business here uh, in the region, uh, I'm really excited to serve on that, and then I'm, uh, I also serve as vice chair of the Elder Affairs Committee, uh, which is quite relevant to uh, 
this region, given that Barnesville County is the oldest region in the state, uh, and also serve as the vice, vice chair of uh, arts, tourism, and culture, uh, which is, is the bread and butter of, of how most of us make our lives here. Uh, and so we've been spending a lot of time uh, on those issues, uh, issues on zoning reform, public health issues as well that, that I had spent time uh, working on in my prior role. Uh, so, so the House did a nice handoff for us in the budget. The Senate took up our budget two weeks ago. Uh, we were, we were um, you know, there's certainly our revenue shortfalls in FY17 uh, that are going to likely mean imminent end of fiscal year cuts. I think around now we're thinking, what, 400 and something? 436 million. 436 million. million. Um, and likely to see further uh, a, a similar situation, a, a similar revenue problem uh, in, in in FY18. Uh, my colleague, uh, who for several years chaired the the Revenue Committee on the Senate side, sort of described the predicament that you know we have a a, a 20th century tax revenue system, taxation system for our 21st century economy. Uh, and so, in a little bit, I'll talk a little uh, about expansion of room occupancy and other, other initiatives we're taking. Um, but we were able to be pretty successful in the Senate budget. Uh, we secured funding for Children's Clove, uh, capital funds for the Barnstable Fire and Rescue Training Academy, uh, for site loss services, for uh, Housing Assistant Corporation, and the Community Development Partnership. Uh, we were also able to secure a $1.25 million increase uh, to the Small Business Technical Assistance Program, uh, which is a total of $2.5 million. Uh, that goes to organizations like uh, Coastal Community Capital and Hyannis uh, to use funds to, to support small businesses uh, on the Mid-Cape and on the islands. Uh, and a total, we were able to secure uh, $2.4 million in additional funding uh, in, in, in the budget. Uh, the Senate added uh, $50 million to uh, the budget that was put up by Ways and Means, so we were very proud of the, the 2.4 2. out of 50 was uh, uh, something we're very grateful for. Um, and we've been spending a lot of time thinking about, uh, on, on the Hill, you're always sort of looking at what's the vehicle that's moving and, and where do you have an opportunity really to highlight an issue that's critically important you know, to your region and, and the people you represent. Um, and, and that has very much been centered around uh, expansion of room occupancy tax to include short-term rentals uh, and its interplay with uh, the significant wastewater uh, concerns and costs that our communities have, uh, I think, in every single community that I represent, but probably no more uh, urgently than here on the Mid-Cape and here in Yarmouth. Um, on it, it's likely that uh, ex expanded room occupancy is going to move. Uh, the Senate took it up in our budget. Uh, I don't think it's going to come out of the conference committee. My hunch is the House is going to take up a bill in July. Uh, this is something that uh, Representative Sarah Peake has been working on for 11 years since she got up there. Um, if we uh, have extended room occupancy, uh, this is for short-term rentals like Airbnb and other rentals. Uh, for our communities, this will, considering the local option component, it's a, a pretty sizable chunk of uh, resources, a pretty big chunk of property tax relief uh, that, that towns will be getting. Uh, and so this being the vehicle that's moving, uh, our office spent a lot of time in, in, with other members of the de delegation thinking about, all right, if we can get some of these additional resources uh, and if we're going to earmark some of these resources to wastewater, uh, you know, wh where does that go? What, what's the bucket that that looks like? Uh, and so we engaged uh, the Cape Cod Chamber. Uh, has a, a, a working group on wastewater, uh, worked with a number of municipal officials. Actually, Dan Kanapik uh, was truly extraordinary um, in, in, in getting right up to speed and, and helping us out in, in trying to think through, you know, how do, how do you create a mechanism that given, given that under 208, each of the towns are responsible for addressing the wastewater, you know, problem, even though you have, uh, you know, certainly shared, shared embayments and shared problems, um, how do you create a mechanism that's going to help the towns uh, basically meet this $4 billion challenge that we have across the region um, without creating a new bureaucracy, without creating something that's just going to be another headache for folks like Dan and, and the folks who work for him, um, and, and to create a, a, a bureaucracy. Uh, and so we work to uh, sort of file this idea of a, a, a Cape Cod Water Protection Trust. I'm glad to elaborate on that. Uh, I, would, I would consider it something I filed in the Senate budget. Uh, there's a lot of reception for it in the Senate. We didn't do it in the budget because essentially it's sort of a conversation starter, but I think we feel, feel well positioned uh, to continue to move the issue. Um, 
was really glad to see the, the Cape Cod Times uh, support of the proposal uh, in, in Saturday's newspaper, uh, and really trying to work to have a, a really collaborative process to hear from uh, business leaders, municipal officials, electeds, uh, environmentalists about how, how we all, you know, I think there's consensus that this is a really big problem um, and that if we don't, you know, as, as, as uh, Wendy Northcross of the Chamber says, you know, if you, don't, if you don't have clean water, if we don't have clean water to sell, we don't have anything to sell. Um, you know, but certainly appreciate further feedback on this. This is a, a work in progress. Um, I think the entire delegation as well is going to be looking at uh, what actually shakes out in expanded room occupancy as far as the um, a mechanism potentially to fund, to put resources. Uh, so glad to elaborate this, and I, and I brought paper as well, so you can take home reading. Uh, but certainly consider this as a conversation starter, and so if there is something you see in there that you don't like or something you love and want more of, um, please let us know, because we're, we're actively working on having a pretty collaborative process. And just, again, really thank Dan for um, being truly extraordinary. Uh, in, in assisting us very quickly. Um, there is actually going to be a hearing. Uh, the Joint Committee on Revenue is going to have a hearing, uh, or I'm sorry, the Joint Committee on Financial Services uh, is going to have a hearing uh, next Monday, June 12th, at Barnesville Town Hall on this short-term rental proposal. So I think it's something that, uh, you know, especially for municipalities who've been, I think, eagerly awaiting the, the expansion of room occupancy and what that would mean for the town's bottom line, uh, encourage people to, to attend and participate. Um, and then on school funding challenges, uh, we were just meeting with uh, DY Superintendent Carol Woodbury a few weeks back. Um, you know, I know that you've been working with the school committee and your counterparts in Dennis uh, on funding challenges. Uh, you know, really, we've tried to do our, our part to try to increase funding for regional school transportation, uh, other issues, uh, looking at uh, the recommendations that came out of the Fund Foundation Budget Review Commission. Uh, there's four components to that. If you look at what we did in the Senate, uh, we addressed uh, the components around uh, help helping school districts and schools uh, pay for health care costs um, and also looked at what's the other piece. Uh, but what we didn't look at is um, on, on health care costs and then on unspent costs and special <coughs> education costs, which are significant. Um, what was not addressed in the Senate budget and is a recommendation in the Foundation Budget Review Commission is around providing resources for English language learners. Um, so I think that's something that we need to, to go back to um, and make sure that, you know, certainly DY and, and Barnes will receive some resources there. Um, but very much, you know, aware that I think the challenge is just in, in, in how the formulas shake out. And I think no one knows this better than, than uh, Tim's predecessor, Cleon Turner, who's a real sort of expert on Chapter 70 funding, um, you know, that I think we've got uh, a really tough, you have a really tough predicament, um, the towns of Dennis and Yarmouth, uh, but particularly Yarmouth does, in just how uh, this is structured, and that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm working to learn and understand um, and, and be as fierce of an advocate for as I can. So with that, we are yours. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Eric. Start someplace else, please. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back to you. Okay. Um, Mark? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for both of you for being here and um, for placing, obviously, CAPE issues at the, at the, at, at, as a top priority. Very much appreciate that. Um, I'd like to sort of first talk about wastewater. Obviously, you're aware of the magnitude of the problem, and I think it's important that somehow um, we all leave this room with a recognition that the state is going to have to put resources on the table at a significant level uh, to help Cape Cod through this, and particularly this community. Um, I was at the town meeting in 2011. Uh, the voters sent a very, very clear message about the need for state help. Now, uh, my calculations show that when you look at other communities around the Commonwealth, particularly MWRA communities, the state has been able to come up with at least a third of the overall cost. So I think for us, the starting point, at least for me, is you know where can we work with the state in finding a third uh, at least? And then maybe there are a package of other local option taxes that might find ways to ease the burden as well. The other issue is going to be how to deal with uh, low to moderate income consumers, um, particularly seniors, people living on fixed income, and finding some way to provide some relief 
or some offsets. Uh, there are other federal programs that recognize that as an issue and actually allow funding for that. I think that's going to be a priority as well. Um, while on wastewater, there's one thing that I think we're going to need your help on that's sort of outside of the bigger issue in terms of funding, but maybe help with some specific projects that do have a huge impact in terms of water quality here in Yarmouth and, and to some degree in Dennis. Um, one of the issues that, that I've started to sort of sink my teeth into is the issue of Route 6. Um, there's a bridge that's over Bass River. It's a bridge that's very constricted, um, but when you talk to Mass DOT, it doesn't even show up on their radar screen. It's going to be a very expensive bridge uh, to replace and to fix, and it sort of has fallen down on the priority list. Um, if we could get work done, we could accelerate the design work and some improvements on that bridge. Quite frankly, the bridge itself could add a significant level of improvement to the water quality in Bass River. Mm. Now, that's something that doesn't show up. I mean, it's, it's buried in our, the town of Yarmouth's overall wastewater plan, but it's an area where the state can begin accessing some of the federal dollars that it accesses through federal highway to actually do some work that could be incredibly helpful. So I, I want to put that on your radar screen. I think uh, we're going to be talking about how we can sort of move that project along, but we're going to need your help. A lot of talk about when you're talking about the Bass River Bridge, Selectman Forest. Um, without question, um, yes, you're right. Uh, when, when you talk to Mass DOT, it's not a conversation that they want to have right now. The, the most recent number that I heard from a couple of folks over at Mass DOT is it's estimated that each direction to rebuild that bridge, each direction would cost $60 million each way, so $120 million to replace both sides, east and west, on Route 6. Um, whether or not that number is accurate, I can't tell you, but that's what I had heard um, thrown back at me from someone from Mass DOT because we started having these conversations, as you know, in the business. It doesn't just happen where you walk in with a list and say, this is what I want, and you walk out with it. It begins with um, putting it on someone's radar screen, then having a conversation, then asking really nice, asking really nice twice, and moving on down the line. So, so far, the response is, hasn't been negative. It's been, hey, it's going to cost $60 million each way. Um, one thing surrounding that, that I had an interesting conversation with a gentleman from Dennis, because as it's part of your water quality plan in Yarmouth, it, equally so it is in Dennis, with it touching both towns, is, um, and this is a conversation, I'm, I'm, since it was just put in front of me, is the railroad bridge mm -hmm. that's right there is looking at dealing with, because the railroad bridge is more of a pinch on the river than, um, I, I I, I'm guessing just by looking at it that that's more of a pinch than the um, Route 6 bridges are. And as they're going to be doing the bridge, um, which we hope to shortly name the Georgia Lair Bridge um, over uh, the Bass River for the bike path, uh, looking at the footings on that bridge and seeing if there's any way that we can incorporate into that, ripping out some of that area where it comes down in almost a, a pyramid fashion and interrupts the water flow during, you know, during the tidal changes. So I'd like to look at that first uh, because that can probably be done cheaper um, because I don't think until we get past that that w I'm going to be able to get an awful lot of response from Mass DOT on just assuming a $120 million project. But we are putting it out there. I mean, sooner or later, I, I, I can't recall when the last rebuild of that bridge was like over 40 years ago, I want to say. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to alarm people, but there are issues with the mm -hmm. bridge that need attention. Structural integrity yes. issues, for sure. Yes. I d and again, I don't want to alarm people, but I think, quite frankly, what could be very helpful is just to begin the design process, get it on, get some more initial work, some preliminary design work, sure. and begin the process of permitting. The permitting of that project alone is going to take two or three years. The, um, I, I will tell you, too, I mean, like you speak about getting it onto, uh, you know, the tip, the Mass DOT has the tip. Um, uh, m much smaller project that I got put on the tip just a few months ago was a, uh, a rebuild of the intersection at Old Main and Route 28. The idea that trying to alleviate some of the traffic coming from Dennis over the Bass River Bridge into Yarmouth so that we can um, uh, get more people through there and hopefully help support our businesses and support our residents with their commutes through. Um, that's a, uh, that was a small ask. That's about $3 million for that project. I, I think I, I'm not afraid to go back and knock on their door again and ask for them to uh, give me uh, 4,000 times that amount, <laughs> 40 <laughs> times that amount, 4,000% 4, 4, above that mark. I'm not afraid to ask for anything. Um, and like that. I said, the conversations have already 
basically started. But again, I, I really want to take a look first, uh, uh, Selectman, at um, as we're dealing with constructing that um, that bridge over the old rail trail, see what kind of um, improvement in the flow of um, you know, of water we get once we do that, and then we get a better idea. We've looked we've looked at it, and have. we can we can provide some information to you that'll show it's a significant I benefit. I would from love a that, water please. quality point of view, please. and it becomes a financial burden that does not rest on the taxpayers of Yarmouth. That's the All goal. Right. I mean, this is this is part of the challenge that we faced. Is we need to get every state dollar we can get our hands on, and this is one that shouldn't be uh, too difficult to at least make the case for. I understand the amount itself is pretty significant. Um, with, if I can just in, be indulged for one more question, Madam Chairman. Do you want me to answer the wastewater yes. piece before? Okay, so so on, on um, Slocum Forest to your. Uh, the, the first comment about resources from the state. Uh, so this is something that the delegation feels uh, very strongly about. If you look at the wastewater problem that we have, um, if we just were building uh, or needing to address wastewater uh, for those of us who live here 12 months out of the year, um, that, that, that cost, uh, that nut would be very significantly different from what we need for peak flow. Um, and, and actually, to, to paraphrase Dan, uh, said this in a meeting, and, and, and we love it so much that we, we've, we've taken it on, you know, is that you know, if, you, if you are coming over the bridge and flushing a toilet, you've got to be part of the solution. Because otherwise, it is just going to rest on the backs of uh, our year-round residents here, uh, our residents or property owners here, uh, whether in... Um, property taxes or in betterments. Actually, um, Representative Peak uh, often talks about how, so Province sounds a little ahead of the curve, they put in a sewer. Uh, her betterment cost is actually as much as her property taxes. Um, and so this is something that I've been really keenly aware of in that trying to make the case on Beacon Hill that although you come to our communities in this sort of beautiful, idyllic, you know, eight or 13 weeks out of the year, um, that many of us who live here are living on fixed incomes, um, and many of our property owners are living on fixed incomes, or many of our families are, you know, maybe land rich because you came here or you bought in 30 years ago, um, but that doesn't, that doesn't translate to, you know, having a actual cash, right? Um, so under the 208 plan, which has been signed off by the Department of Environmental Protection and by the governor, uh, it commits that the state would be responsible for uh, up to 25 percent. I think the um, I, I like hearing this number that, that of, of the third uh, that MWRA communities have received. Um, you know, so we'd like that third. We don't want the cost uh, that MWRA communities have have sustained. Um, and really, in this proposal, uh, thought very carefully about not creating an MWRA for Cape Cod. Um, but I think that of the $4 billion problem we have, uh, looking for at least a billion dollars from the state over a certain period of time, uh, and, and the idea is that expansion of room occupancy is how we would get that. Um, it would be, it's possible, but very, very difficult for this delegation to continually get 20 to 30 million uh, in appropriations year after year after year to help us solve this problem. We need to have a mechanism to do this um, that, is, that, is, that is outside of the budgeting process, um, even with the bonding process, uh, you know, that is something that, that is difficult. So, so trying to, by tying this in part, by tying the revenue for this in part to expand it to room occupancy and potentially other sources, um, you know, it, it, it's a way for people who we presume if they're coming here, they're going to flush the toilet at some point, um, probably multiple times, uh, and so that's how they can uh, help, help contribute. That's great. Thank you. Just one last point, if it's okay. Um, I'm looking at the uh, state education aid numbers for, for DY, and I'm looking at them over the past 10 years. I mean, those numbers are basically flat. I mean, there's been almost no change. And so as we get prepared to work with Dennis to find a way to sort of uh, have, a, have a better relationship in terms of funding our schools, uh, the backdrop that we're faced with here, obviously, is a state aid situation that has been relatively unchanged on average over the past 10 to 12 years. And uh, that makes it very, very difficult. So it's nice to hear stories that we're looking at reforming Chapter 70, that there's a recognition that uh, the, the, the foundation budget, budget doesn't accurately address some of the expense issues that communities are wrestling with. Um, but quite frankly, many of us are nervous that every time there's a reform of a budget number, uh, at the end of the day, the inequities that we have to address here are often 
forgotten. So I think to some degree, I think from my point of view, I think the more we can have regular interaction with your office as well. I mean, I know this is a school issue, but really it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental municipal issue. And I think the more we can be kept abreast of what's happening, how those reform efforts are going. I know they're not going to go far until there's an increase in overall state revenue. I get that. But I think it's important to understand in terms of where those reform efforts are going, what's what they're thinking about. Uh, we obviously, at the end of the day, don't want to have a reform package adopted that ends up hurting us. Sure. I would encourage every municipal board and every school board here in the Cape to be screaming from the mountaintops. Because we're doing our best up there, we we we, we, we are, and, and as you know, uh, selectmen, we interact regularly with with our boards of selectmen, with our school superintendents, with our school uh, you know with our school committees, um, and uh, like I said, we're, we're certainly working hard on it. But yeah, it's one of them terms like we used to say when I was in the state police that you need some backup. Well, we need some backup, and that would be, as, and and I know you folks certainly haven't been silent here in Yarmouth, um, neither have any of the others, and that's certainly not uh, the point that I'm trying to make, but. Uh, as loud as you've been, raise your voices even louder and um, and bring them to Boston, and it will be helpful. And again, we have competing interests across the state here that we have to wrestle with. Um, that's just the reality of it, as much as we'd like to, you know, uh, uh, like hope that it's not. But um, we could certainly use as much we buttress to our argument. We can fill we some had. busloads for you. Yeah. You're a good man. No, Thank I mean, you very I, much. I, and I think <laughs> that from a timeline perspective, when this new revenue potentially would be there for, for schools is going to be going into in, starting in 2019. So the coalition building work, especially with um, other districts across the Commonwealth who are sort of in a similar predicament um, as, as you folks in the Berkshires, yeah. that co starting that coalition building now, and it's going to take a while, um, you know, w w we're just at a disadvantage from a numbers game. Um, E even when you combine the Berkshire delegation with the Cape and Islands delegation, so so having, um, I actually think you know the piece that that I, I I've often referenced and, and I'm still waiting to get my hands on this list uh, is anecdotally many of our colleagues uh, if they don't own property here they spend time here but many of them have second homes here um, and and would really I, I think need to hear. P people care about this place, uh, and our, our colleagues care about this place in, in, in not just a, an abstract way. They, they live it. They're here. Many of them own property here. Um, and so I think working towards in, 28, in 2018, 2019, yeah. uh, he hearing from a, a coalition would, would help because it is, it's a numbers game, and it's a very tough, tough, just it, it's math, and it, it's, it's, it's tough for, for us, for the delegation. I, I think some of us are very willing to work on helping build a bit more of a grassroots movement to help get the kind of support that you need and to build alliances yeah. elsewhere. And I'm, I'm a big fan, just personally, I mean, I got my start in politics uh, when I was 16 years old as a student at Nauset advocating for, for an override, um, and, and DY actually had an override, and we were successful in Nauset, and I think unfortunately at the time the, the DY schools weren't. So, so this is something that I really you know, care about, and I think from an organizing and activating activist perspective. We've got some time. Let's work to build towards this um, and I think at least put ourselves in a better position uh, going into what we know is a very tough fight. So thank you. Great. Mike? Um, are, are the themes uh, of this conversation are interesting. Drugs and money, two of my favorite <laughs> subjects. And coming from a lawyer. Um, <laughs> Don't forget wastewater and I will use drugs and money. I think I'll start with the drugs. Tim. Um, yes, sir. <clears throat> I commend you in your efforts to, <clears throat> you know, dr draft legislation that um, makes these very um, dangerous and poisonous um, drugs illegal and to um, impose strict uh, prison sentences for people who, who deal in these, these poisons. That is what they are. Yes, sir. That are killing people in our communities. Um, in terms of the larger picture, however, it seems like that, that we're not making a lot of progress in, in the drug war. And it, there's probably a host of reasons for that, but um, I think there's kind of a cultural acceptance of drugs that has, that has increased over the years. Um, when I was younger, we had people that used drugs, and back in the 60s, there were different drugs, and there wasn't a lot of heroin. There was some, but there wasn't a lot. There was more LSD and, and, and drug mescaline and drugs like that. 
But today, I, I don't think people are that alarmed when, when they hear about drugs. I, I think our police do a good job in, in catching drug traffickers in Yarmouth, but the next week there's more. There's more. It, it, this doesn't seem to change. And recently we've had the um, legalization of marijuana, and now the towns are struggling with that issue um, on the Cape, saying, do, you know, do they want these retail outlets in their communities? And I, and I think one of the uh, principles that go to that question as to whether or not you want that in town is the message that you send to the community, particularly the young community. One side argues that, well, you'll be able to regulate drugs. Um, and there's revenue, perhaps, to, to be gained. But on the other hand, I think you're encouraging that, that drug culture when you do that, because you're, you're saying to, to, to young people, <clears throat> it's OK to get high. I mean, it's, it's not a big deal. It's, it's not really a bad thing. On the other side of the coin, somebody would say, well, you have alcohol. My answer to that is, because you have one problem, do you want two? Alcohol is a huge problem. There's no question about that. <clears throat> so I, I guess my question is, what responsibility do we have as state senators, as legislators, as selectmen, community leaders um, on this issue? And what, if anything, do you think we can do other than passing legislation, um, you know, identifying other harmful drugs, imposing strict, uh, stiff sentences for traffickers. What else can we do to stem the tide of what appears to be a never-ending epidemic? Sure. One fault that I continue to see in how we allocate money in dealing with this uh, in the state budget is I think that we put too low of a premium on prevention efforts, getting into the schools and dealing with children at um, getting to some of these children um, you know, en masse, but also, you know, identifying those that are at risk through expert screening and the like. Uh, we don't put enough into that, and that continues to be an argument that I know, uh, and, and I'm speaking with, with many, if not all, the members of the delegation um, behind me in this thought. Um, we, we, we don't put nearly enough into this prevention, and we need to start steering some of, some more money in that direction because, you know, here you truly have, you know, a penny saved is ultimately going to be a dollar earned further on down the road. Um, and I also think of a conversation that I had not too long ago with the governor when I was speaking to Governor mm -hmm. Baker, and he was describing, you know, some of his um, frustrations in, you know, where areas that he's seeing that we can improve, and of course there are many, and we address some of the, some of these issues through the groundbreaking opioid legislation that, um, that, we, uh, that the governor signed um, you know, in the last session that's now a model that's being used by other states. We were the first one to do it, and it's being used as a model for other states around the country. But one of the things that um, wasn't addressed in that that um, is trying to be dealt with at the executive level, but we are going to have to deal with um, at the legislative level is the quality of the programs that we offer to folks in recovery and treatment when they go into what they find is that the treatment cycle uh, what the governor had said was he said that um, on average it's six times that a person enters treatment goes through the program comes out goes back on the street tries starting to build their lives fails starts using the narcotic again and then you know re-enters the treatment you're saying if we could cut that number in half by improving the value, uh, uh, the value of the, the service that's being delivered to the addict, um, it would also have the net effect of doubling the number of beds that we have. And that's one area without question that we need to look at um, and that the governor is certainly cognizant of and he's working with Secretary Sutters from HHS right now as we speak to try and fix. Um, a lot of it, too, is going to have to deal with, um, we have to deal with the insurance companies. And again, getting back to the thing with the competing interests. In the last session, I believe it was, we mandated 14, 15 days? 14, yeah. 14 days. Thank you very much, Senator. 14 days of um, insurance coverage for people going into um, treatment for um, uh, opiate, opiate addiction. We need to extend that. To what number? I don't know. Some people right now are arguing 30 days. 
Um, some people are arguing 60 days. I've even heard 180 days. I have friends of mine who've lost their sons to addiction, dear friends of mine, and I knew their children. And they're telling me that it takes five to six years, based upon their, their experience, five to six years of aftercare and working with an addict to get them through the cycle and to, get, and, and to cure the addict mind. We just have to really start looking at this with a whole new approach. And you're absolutely right, Selectman. I, I'm, I'm great at filing legislation dealing with the law enforcement end of it because it falls into my background and it's what I, it's what I came into this job being good at. I can recognize, because that's the third stool of the, of the, the, um, the chair that is gonna help us beat, beat this, is prevention, addiction, and uh, I mean, uh, uh, prevention, treatment, and enforcement. I'm really, really good at the enforcement end, and that's what I stick to, and that's what I'm writing my bills with. Um, but I'm also listening and working with and keeping an open mind uh, and looking for answers, searching for answers to try and find stuff outside of the enforcement genre, shall we say, and in the prevention area. So um, I, I, I hope that that's somewhat helpful for your inquiry, Selectman, and I'll turn the floor over to my, uh, to my dear Senator. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I think Representative well, well, well said. I mean, we are, we're losing a generation. We're, we're losing my generation of Cape Codders. Um, I, I, I can talk about the epidemic uh, from a, a public health lens where I, I worked at the Department of Public Health for six years, um, worked in, in harm reduction, prevention work uh, in other arenas, so have some understanding. Um, you know, and really, I, you know, I think if you look at if you look at the dollars, I think here in Barnesville County, if you look at all the money that's spent on the open epidemic, I think less than 2% of that goes to prevention resources. Um, in the legislation that Representative Whalen referenced, um, there's a whole curricula for schools, but there's no resources attached to actually implement it. And I think that we've done a good job in the state of restricting access to uh, prescription the diversion of prescription medications. I think we've done a, a very good job of that. Um, but in part because of that, you're seeing the emergence of fentanyl, carfentanyl, other elements um, in, into the drug supply. And I think that, uh, you know, from what, what we know about this disease, that you, to, to, to meaningfully have someone recover from this disease, and, and that recovery is, is all, all, the recovery is for the rest of your life, but, you know, seven to nine years. Of, of services of treatment. And what we don't have uh, here on Cape Cod, but we don't have anywhere in, in the Commonwealth um, and, and, and a few places in the country, we don't have that continuum of care. And so what ends up happening is that you have people who, um, people are struggling with this disease who uh, get into treatment um, and they, th that's not continued. Uh, so much of the time, if you talk to folks working in substance abuse treatment, uh, is spent arguing, advocating for their patients uh, in front of the insurers. And I think that, you know, I look at this a, a little bit from a historical context. I think the last time we were dealing with an epidemic um, in the Commonwealth sort of, of this significance, uh, if you look at from a morbidity and mortality perspective and a, and a human toll, uh, was the HIV AIDS epidemic. And there are a number of things that have now become standard practice uh, in HIV prevention and treatment. And Massachusetts really been a leader here. So Massachusetts was the first state to actually get uh, infection rates of, of, of HIV to basically plateau so that we weren't seeing additional increases. We were able to basically stop the spread of HIV with one person. Um, and that really took an effort that um, was tied to significant dollars, that was tied to significant prevention efforts, um, that, and we really threw the kitchen sink uh, at the issue, um, and that we tried interventions, uh, unconventional interventions, um, treatment prevention interventions that I think at first blush you'd say, well, why, why the heck would you do that? Um, and I think that that's, that's the spirit where we need to continue to tackle uh, this epidemic. Um, I think we, we, in public health and in uh, substance abuse intervention, um, often some of the most evidence-based effective treatments and preventions are ones that at first, first blush make us uncomfortable. And I think that we've got to be honest about that as well. Um, but I think that continuum of care is really key. Uh, and then doing that work, you know, I, th I think there is a culture of, of drug and alcohol use here. Um, on Cape Cod, on, on the islands. I think it's actually, uh, I see it in all the communities, um, how, how, um, 
how common it is, I think, that. I was talking to someone who had moved to Nantucket recently and with her family, and they were observing that at the school events that they'd go to, all the parents would be drinking. And in the community they came from that was not a, a Cape and Islands community before this, there was never alcohol. The superintendent was talking about there was never alcohol involved. So, so we've got a big cultural problem here. Uh, and I think that the best place for that to start really is, is meaningful, real prevention work in our schools. Um, you know, we can't just ask DY to do one more thing. Um, the delegation worked in, in, in a great fashion to get uh, grants last fiscal year, or this fiscal year rather, for $15,000 for each school. Uh, those were eliminated in mid-year spending cuts in a very frustrating way. Um, you know, but I'm not, until we really get serious about prevention and providing a continuum of care, I'm actually not optimistic that we're going to really bend, bend this curve further, and it's, it's pretty tragic and, and horrible. And further into that point, Senator, um, what they did with the smoking, anti-smoking campaign through education and reaching kids very early on, and um, they used to have the rather graphic commercials on TV about what could happen to you. Um, people with couldn't speak that had uh, surgical <clears throat> um, procedures. Um, I mean, I, I, I think that's a no-brainer. I think that's probably the most effective component of dealing with the problem, but that takes care of the generation to be. Like you said, it doesn't take care of your generation. And um, Tracy and I, because I've seen Tra Tracy was instrumental in bringing Chris Heron down. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know Chris from Fall River. He's I attended that presentation. Former All-American yeah. uh, basketball player and uh, professional athlete and uh, – one of the things that, that, that Chris said, and he, he's spoken at DY, and always spoken at NOS and Barnstable. I've, I've seen him several times. I've read his book. Um, one of the things that he said at that meeting Tracy and I were at that, that's kind of haunted me ever since, we know that certain people got into opioids because of pharmaceuticals um, that they were prescribed by well-intended people. Um, and there's been that connection with addiction. But I don't think that's the case with everybody that uses heroin. And he was talking about his own journey from the top to, I guess, the, the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and he said that he often wondered why kids for the first time make a decision to do drugs, to do serious drugs. He started with cocaine. And as he tells the story, he was at Boston College uh, on a basketball scholarship, and he walked into a room and he saw a guy and a girl uh, doing some something um, at a bureau, <coughs> and they were putting out the lines and everything. And he said, I'm out of here. And the girl said, come back, Chris. It's, it's not going to hurt you. And his question was, why did he go back? Mm. Because that started uh, a spiral downward that lasted many, many years and took a tremendous toll on his family. <clears throat> so I, I think in addition to, and I agree with both of you, that a lot's got to be done in terms of education and prevention. Um, I think sometimes people overlook the question that Chris asked, and that is, w w what's absent in these kids' lives? What makes a kid make those choices? <clears throat> I've seen it in my own family. I, I had a brother that was a surgeon. I had a sister that was a teacher. I was a lawyer. I had a brother that had a PhD in psychology, and I had other people that did drugs. Same parents, same background, <clears throat> same lessons, same schools. Why? You know? <clears throat> There's something that is absent, I think. In, in young people's lives that compels them to um, to go that way. And uh, I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that the more positive programs that are provided for them through the schools or through recreation departments, <clears throat> um, I, I've coached youth sports for 25 years, and I can tell you that the number of kids that I worked with that went that did drugs was minuscule because they were productive. I, coached, I talked to Coach Hoare at the high school 
<clears throat> who's coached track and field for over 30 years and has had he has a wonderful uh, um, program and he, he said almost nobody that he can think of mm -hmm. that he's so so there's got to be that component too about putting positive options before kids and realizing that they they have to have these things in their lives to minimize their risk of making really bad choices yep. I mean, I, I think all of that is, is well said. I, I think when we're talking about kids or young people, I think we also have to widen that, broaden that lens sort of beyond 17, 18 when they're graduating high school. And I think if, if anecdotally the stories that I've been told from people struggling with addiction and with this disease here on the Cape, um, it's often it's in that period for many where, you know, after they leave or as they're leaving high school, um, right, you're not, if you're someone who, uh, is um, staying here on the Cape, um, immediately there's not a lot of options. And it's a, can be a pretty uh, depressing, limited environment uh, in the off season for a young person. And I think that, that component as well, you know, that, that there, um, you know, we have this whole kind of community that's based around our, our schools and our young people, but it, but it stops when they graduate high school. And that doesn't, that doesn't persist and continue in any way. And I think that's a, I think that's part of, I, I don't have hard data on this, but I think that's part of why um, this has impacted our communities uh, almost in a way, almost more worse than, than most other parts in the state. And I think part of that's tied to, you know, I mean, we can go big and kind of macro, we're trying to economic development and, and, and kind of other things that are really critically important. Um, you know, I think another part of it is that, uh, I don't know, you know, making sure that there's recreational, my, Sister-in-law has been when playing pickleball in Truro and has found this whole community with that, and that was something that we didn't have a few years ago. So, I, I mean, I, again, no, no good solutions there, but I think there's that piece in that sort of 18 to 26 bracket, um, which we, I think, could do a better job looking at here on the Cape. I had some other questions on education, but I'll defer at this point so we can hear from the others. Norm. Uh, first of all, thanks for coming. Uh, we've... Uh, I think been remiss in not asking to, to meet with our representatives for some time and and I hope we can have more conversations like this because I, you know, I I submitted a list uh, as you know earlier uh, and uh, this is um, a great forum so you know, thank a, you there's a you know substantial number of things that the state uh, the state and the towns need to work with, uh, on and um, I'm not going to echo some of the things that have already been said because I think there's been some really good commentary but I would as a follow-up on one of the issues, the, the uh, taxation, I'm, I'm not a fan of new taxes. Um, I don't like the idea, personally, of uh, taxing homeowners who are trying to rent out their homes uh, to gain a little income to cover their, their expenses. Uh, I, that additional tax is repugnant to me. But on the other hand, I'm concerned about the wastewater issue and, and we may have to have a balancing act. I'm also concerned with the $400 million deficit at the state level and the unfunded liabilities that are out there that are in the mega millions and billions of dollars. And, and we, we've got about $100 million unfunded liability here that we need some help with at the state level. And it's not a matter of uh, funding that. We need some help in legislating that, uh, in dealing with the issue. I know the state has tried to do that but we need additional help in that regard that uh, where the benefit flows down to the community in some way negotiating on a broad basis with all the unions uh, in the state to deal with OPEP funding. We've, if, we, if we were called to fund that immediately, it would cost us, our community, $2 million a year. I can't imagine what the number is statewide. Big. Uh, it's big. Uh, but we need help at the state level in order to do that. It, 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 it just is not effective uh, at, at this level. Um, but I'd like to come back to the, other, the taxation issue, Airbnb. Um, I hope that the direction is not simply to take whatever proposal uh, comes, gets moved forward and use that to fill the $400 million gap as opposed to saying, okay, uh, we have some very specific needs in Cape Cod, uh, 
and we need to address those and assign those funds to that, that uh, uh, direction. Secondly, I hope that we don't lose sight of the fact that there's a long-range focus. Eventually, those liabilities uh, for wastewater will be paid off. We'd like to retain those funds, not have them go into the general fund uh, and be otherwise assigned away from uh, the communities here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, issues that are not being funded appropriately, and um, having those funds reassigned elsewhere would be a major uh, uh, problem in the future. But I'd like, to, I'd like to come back and relate a couple of things that I, that I uh, uh, mentioned in my notes. I'd mentioned ELL uh, education, and it was really, that's the tip of the iceberg in terms of the things that our community uh, has to address additional costs of educating our students. Yarmouth has a very substantial percentage of high need students. That's driving our school budget. Um, at, and it's interesting to see how the state sometimes looks at one problem as, you know, this is a problem that's unrelated and, and uh, to another problem, when in fact the whole thing is, uh, is related. And what I'm referring to is affordable housing. Another major issue that we need to deal with as, as a community and as a state. Um, why is it that Yarmouth has such a high percentage of high need students uh, and who are economically underprivileged, uh, so to speak, yet um, we seem to be saying that there's not enough affordable housing in Yarmouth? Uh, the state says, oh, you've only got 4% affordable housing. In fact, if you look at the economic statistics, 26% of our housing in Yarmouth is affordable housing. And that 22% gap is because the state's regulations will not recognize what the community has already done. So. What, what, is, what is happening is we've got all the problems associated with uh, uh, economic disadvantage and high need students that are driving our school budget. And just recently, yesterday, uh, our Affordable Housing Trust authorized $1.2 million uh, for a subsidy of another uh, development in Yarmouth for affordable housing. That's about three to three and a half million dollars in the last year and a half that this community has uh, devoted to that issue. And yet we are constantly under the fear of 40B uh, development because the state says, well, you're not up to 10%. We're way over 10%. And that should be uh, well known because of just look at our school systems and what we're trying to do and, and, the, and the children that we are educating. We've got a high uh, uh, um, numbers of ELL students. How can, how can we not have affordable housing if we have children in, in, in the schools that uh, uh, we're having to educate it? it the numbers don't, don't add up. And the state, because of silo thinking, is driving us in, in, in uh, directions that require substantial amounts of funding. And it's not right. We need some relief. We can't keep funding affordable education and keep funding uh, uh, substantial amounts of, of um, educational effort uh, and have the state uh, really at odds with us in that regard. And that's another, another uh, uh, argument with regard to uh, the Chapter 70 funding. You know, we, we've got to find ways to educate uh, the children in our communities uh, and have support from the state to do that. Um, you know, economic development is also an, an area uh, of, uh, that is another um, uh, segment of that same problem. The town of Yarmouth, our median family income is in the high 
55 to sixty thousand uh, dollars area substantially lower than Barnstable County the same thing in Dennis same levels and that's substantially lower than the statewide average but again we're being uh, uh, forced through our property tax base to fund educational effort um, and affordable housing even though you know it, we don't have the funds to do it uh, so we need some relief in that and we need uh, focus on additional economic development that <coughs> will not require uh, uh, or, or will not be involved with with tourism and and, and so forth tourism in, in um, uh, Cape Cod is a wonderful industry but it is very low income typically we need to relieve that focus we need to continue to to encourage those businesses to succeed and support them but at the same time we need a balance in our economy and Cape Cod uh, or we'll continue to, to, to put out the fires uh, that are being driven by uh, very um, uh, low income types of businesses. We just covered an awful lot of ground there, so I'm going to hold them. So I'm going to try and cover. I'm going to I'm, I'm going to refer to my notes, uh, off, uh, if you don't mind, and I'll just go through uh, some of these things in, in an attempt to try to answer to some of the, some of the questions and concerns that you duly raise and, and that I share with you as well. And um, some of the issues that I have here uh, under the topic of the uh, state financial health we discussed earlier, the 436 million dollar revenue shortfall that is which is where we stand now for FY17. Um, that uh, the May revenue numbers were reported yesterday and they came in $30 million higher than last year, but it still leaves us at $436 million below what we thought. Now, there are two things that are driving this. Two, two, th there are many things that are driving this, but there are two major issues that we can discuss right now. One is um, uh, capital gains coming in lower than expected. Um, the market tends to go down and then it tends to come up and um, for the first half of the year the market didn't move at all um, unlike what um, when they do these projections in December and January of the year before they had expected greater gains in the stock market and as a result greater income in um, uh, the capital gains that didn't happen so that's one of the what that's one of the things that's why we started sounding the alarm bell before December when the market started to bounce back and we just haven't been able to recover fully um, we're seeing some improvement April was not a very good month um, for revenues and um, usually it is you know with the income taxes that come in we all know April 15th um, but that's that's part of it the other issue that the state is dealing with right now and this is just this is um, the the giant elephant in the room that 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 everybody needs to talk more about and that's the cost of um, mass health mass health right now the, the enrollment on mass health just continues to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow now there are some things that the administration is looking at doing that are not well received down here and that I'm not very happy with, with the business community but we've got to start talking about doing something because we have an awful lot of employers that um, in small businesses and even in larger businesses that are having their employees and they're telling them listen go and sign up for mass health because you'll qualify and it's cheaper so they're taking the cost off of the business and passing it on to the taxpayer i sat in a meeting just a couple of months ago with uh, secretary lapore of anf and secretary sutters of uh, health and human services and just to look at the charts where they were showing that the the growth in mass health enrollment from 2010 to 2016 it's it's staggering so though that's one of the things that we're going to have to address one of the to give you an idea of the number um, of the percentage of the state budget involved here secretary Sutter's explained to us that out of the entire state budget 40.2 billion dollars 40.3 depending upon how much our friends in the Senate added to it 40.2 uh, 40.3 40 you guys did more uh, I think I think we did but, but it was all for the, all for the good. 54% uh, of that number, 54% goes through Secretary Sutter's, um, so, yeah, yeah, Secretary Sutter's over in HHS. Of that 50% of the state budget, 50% is spent on health care. That's OPEB, that's uh, employee health care, that's uh, subsidies on the health connector, and that's mass health. Half of our budget is going in that direction, and we're not getting, you know, it's, it's not all subsidized by the feds. 
um, through the ACA. So we're, we're, we're losing money in that direction as well. So there are many, many challenges that we're facing. Um, so it's not like the state isn't you know, living up to, f and, and I know nobody here assumes that, but I, I, I'm just gonna put it out that the state, uh, the, 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 when there's not an awful lot of money to spend, we're not gonna be able to sprinkle as much around as we would like, and we're just gonna have to continue to work harder and sharpen our pencils and find a way to fix some of these leaks in the boat. And, and I agree with you, Selectman Holcomb, and do so in a way minimizing um, you know, new taxes because taxes um, stifle growth. Um, as for the economic development, we're going to have to look. Th this is kind of the, the, the chicken of the egg, or, or it goes around and around and around. When you, when you speak about um, uh, economic development, we need to have workforce housing available first. Workforce housing, I sat in a meeting with Secretary Ash a couple of months ago, as did, the, as did the Senator, and one of the topics that kept coming up is we have to look at the municipal level at dealing with zoning regulations and, and codes. Maybe look at accessory dwellings as an opportunity to have affordable living spaces for workforce. Once we do that, people that I speak to in not only you know our local small businesses, but over on the other side of the bridge, continually tell me that one of the problems that they have with coming down here is they can't find help. And when they can bring help down here, they can't afford to live down here. So w what came first, the chicken or the egg? Or what comes first? Is it going to be the economic development um, or th that will help, um, hel <coughs> help us improve affordable housing uh, available to the workforce? Or is it getting the workforce down here to draw the employers down? At the end of the day, um, we're going to have to ask ourselves, are we willing to accept industrial development down here? Will the Cape Cod Commission allow it? Will the municipalities allow it? Will our people down here allow industrial development or large-scale development to get some large-scale year-round employers down here? I don't know. That's a conversation that, that we're going to have to have, and that's a question that we're going to have to answer as well. Um, one thing that wasn't brought up but I do want to address with you, Selectman Holcomb, because I know we've, we've dealt, uh, and you've, you've been a great advocate for up in your, uh, you know, up in uh, 6A as well as 28 um, sides of town in dealing with um, Mass DOT and trying to get them down here to look after some of the maintenance issues. Um, last year, toward the end of last year, I brought down um, uh, Jim Kirsten from uh, DOT Administrator Tinlin's office who works directly for the administrator. And we spent a day down here with uh, your DPW director and with town officials and we went around and we looked at some of the issues relating to maintenance, weed overgrowth, some of the issues uh, on the, the road edges up there on Route 6A, um, sidewalks. Um, the age of the signs was actually quite astounding. Um, unfortunately, the state doesn't move at um, a, an, anything more, more quickly than a glacial pace. So uh, we're still working on them, and we're still staying on them to make sure that we get those signs replaced. I've already um, spoken to them twice about making sure that, I mean, my God, what happened down here last year with the weed overgrowth, on, particularly on 28, uh, that's, that's inexcusable. They've, they've heard that from me, and they've heard that loud. So I don't think we're going to have an issue with this. Um, 28 should look uh, as welcoming as possible to our visitors who drive our economy down here. Um, school funding, uh, as we were speaking about with the ELL, well, a lot of those requirements come from the state, but an awful lot of them come from the federal government as well. Um, uh, I don't work in education. My wife does. But um, we, we're going to be dealing with, I believe, uh, over the next uh, few days, we, we are likely going to be dealing with a bill um, to address uh, English uh, as a second language or English language learners um, in the House. I, I think it's, it, it's on the calendar for tomorrow, so we might even be addressing it tomorrow. It was polled out of ways and means, so I've had an opportunity to read it. And there are some interesting things that we're looking at in there, some of them that may be um, cost savings, but one of the things that we're going to be looking at as well, and I like this approach, is before we enact a lot of these regulations is to put together a 17-member working committee to bring in people from DESE, people from the Mass Association of School Superintendents, Mass Association of um, School Committees, to bring in administrators, teacher, teachers from the MTA has a rep, the AFT has a rep, to come in and sit down and look at this, see, see what works, what doesn't, and then particularly from the administrator perspective, to find out we got to find out before we can, uh, before I'll ever get behind anything. Is this going to be an unfunded mandate? Is this going to further saddle the taxpayers in our municipalities that they're going to have to come up with the money, or is it going to put a crunch on our superintendents so they're going to have to look to cut services or staff elsewhere to come up with this great new idea that we just rolled out of Boston? So um, there's. Uh, 
there's an awful lot to that, um, but like I said, it doesn't only rest with the state. It does, a lot of it does indeed rest with the federal government. But at the end of the day, um, you know, w when it comes to the ELL students, what our goal ultimately is, and I know that I speak for, uh, I, I believe I speak for everybody in this room, is we want these students to come in, learn the language, get a great education, and go on and become productive members of society, contributing members of society with great futures ahead of them. Um, and uh, I, I think we're doing a pretty good job of that in this state. We need to find a way maybe um, to, to do a little bit better because you can never be satisfied where you are at any one time. You're always looking to move a little bit further down the road. But um, I kind of like where we are. Um, right now so I'll be looking forward to debating that um, that bill that I was mentioning about um, if we do in fact take it up tomorrow I believe it is tomorrow but it's gonna be interesting it's always nice to learn something new yep and uh, Slack and Holcomb thank you for uh, your questions I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate a little further I don't know if we'll cover everything um, you know I think on fiscal health uh, this is something I'm you know I think not only concerned with now but you know I'm sort of venturing into starting in, in, in public service and, and you you look at these numbers and you project them out 30 40 years where and God willing I, I hope I'm still having some role in our public life um, hopefully that by at that point I'll be retired and just a, a member of the Trail board of selectmen um, but you know we've got not just <laughs> <laughs> yes oh, point well taken He's setting his goals high very <laughs> high the senator the senator is an error um, but uh, you know I mean you look at this and you're like how does this I mean, how does this add up? From, it doesn't add up for my generation. Right. Um, and, you know, this is something I'm, I'm just beginning to learn. I mean, the, the, the knot that we got ourselves here is pretty complicated. So, you know, I, I, I'm not going to venture into trying to unwind that um, six months in, into this position. But it's something that is uh, signif very significant given, um, I think, just our demographic trends. Um, and, and really how do we ensure that we have continued opportunity and, and, and are not going into the position where, um, you know, future generations are, are having a, a worse quality of life. Uh, you know, on, on housing, this is an issue I care deeply about. Um, and, and, you know, when I've been talking about housing, I, I, we spent a lot of time talking about and focused on affordable housing. Um, but the problem here on the Cape is much bigger than that. Um, I, I've, been, I've been beginning to talk about the need for sort of a, a attainable housing, right? That those of us who, so affordable housing is going to help people out who make sort of below 80% of, of, of area median income. Um, people who make 80 to 200% of area median income cannot afford uh, to purchase property here in many cases. Uh, the costs of rent are so astronomically high in many, in many instances um, that you can't save for a down payment. Um, you know, I think things are, are, are not as dire here on the Mid-Cape um, as they are uh, or have become uh, on the outermost reaches of the district I represent, but it's going that way. Um, you know, I remember when uh, Truro was sort of the place that, that you'd, you'd sell your property in Provincetown and move to Truro. Uh, Truro now has a median home price that's uh, upwards of $800,000. Um, and Nantucket, it's over a million. On Martha's Vineyard, it's over a million. Um, and, and it's going that way uh, ever, el elsewhere, in, in, in including here on the Mid-Cape. And I think that, um, you know, th the piece, and, and I know that that, that 40B and it, it is certainly uh, controversial and, and, and difficult with many communities. I mean, I would just caution that um, several of our communities have reached that 10% threshold and, and it hasn't solved the housing problem. So, so, so in a way, the, um, you know, I, I, I think that I'd really like to see our communities really focused on um, middle income housing and, and, you know, affordable housing, but middle income housing, elder housing, uh, really helping to free up. I mean, we, so much of our housing stock goes to second homes um, and, and it's a really big challenge. I think that, you know, quite frankly, we, we have an, um, a pretty bad allergy to development here on Cape Cod. Um, it's a major problem. Uh, you could not build, you know, our quintessential communities under the current zoning regulations, right? You couldn't build Yarmouth Port, you couldn't build Dennis Port, you couldn't uh, have Chatham Village or Provincetown um, un un under what we currently have. And, and, and they, there's a, there is a persistent nimbyism. Um, and, and that is very problematic. Um, and, and, and I think that we need to be really serious about smart development, uh, focusing development in our historical uh, downtown centers, uh, looking at mixed use, 
uh, which Hyannis is considering and Orleans is considering, um, and, and that's just something that I think we really need to address. Otherwise, I, you know, look at the popul look at where the population uh, is going. If I look at my counterparts in my generation who are here, most of us are here because our families have a foothold here, and we couldn't come here in the way that our parents' generation did or, or our grandparents' generations did, and that's something I'm I'm really worried about. Uh, you know, on wastewater. Um, this is a, a major problem that, that frankly, we have the, uh, a threat of a court order. And so um, Selectman Forrest mentioned the dreaded MWRA or earlier, which, which came out of a court order. And so I think I worry about, and I think the delegation worries about, that if the region does not sort of demonstrate a way to, to figure this out, um, that that threat of the court order will be brought back. Um, I think it's likely that we'd be required to do something. Um, and the cost of that would lie solely on uh, property owners, either through property taxes or betterments. And so, you know, again, finding ways for, for everyone who's part of the problem to be paying for that in part. Um, the Cape Cod Chamber has done some very thoughtful research and analysis around figuring out what's, what's that sort of threshold where um, visitors are uh, sort of noticed and are adversely impacted by sort of use fees and, and sort of meals tax and rooms tax. Uh, the number is about 15%, uh, which is estimated in, in, in their research. Um, you know, actually a lot of our communities, only four, under the current uh, room occupancy, um, only four of the 15 towns on the Cape actually go up to the full 6% local option. Uh, so we think there may be some room there. Um, you know, but, but really I think I'm keenly focused on, you know, how, does the, how do we avoid this becoming um, a major burden just solely on, on, on property owners. I think how people are vacationing has changed. Um, I have plenty of counterparts who come uh, to this region and vacation in the summer. I know very few, if any of them, who stay in hotels or motels. Uh, they're all staying in condos or, or cottages that are rented either through Airbnb or VRBO. So, so how we're vacationing is changing, and so I think We've got to catch up to that, um, and then on economic development, I think. Senator, yep. can I ask you? Have yep. you ever have you ever um, rented from Airbnb? Yes, and actually, my my parents um, have rented uh, actually rent several rooms from Airbnb, and, okay. and I have uh, in the last few months, not not here, but in in yep. Connecticut. Um, and one of the additional <coughs> things that uh, shows up on your typical Airbnb bill is a service fee. Yep. Um, and a gratuity fee, separately stated. Um, and, uh, you know, when you add those things up, uh, they come out at about 10 percent. So, uh, you know, I'd be a little bit concerned about, you know, a, a study saying, well, 15 percent is that hurdle rate, yet we can throw another 10 percent on in terms of a uh, uh, tax. Yep. Because I, mean, I think I, there's, yeah. they're already part of the way there. And I think one of the way they attract people is by lowballing the room rate and then tacking on the service fee and the gratuities. Yep. So I think we need to be very careful about how we look at that. Uh, and uh, before we enact something that ultimately does drive away uh, uh, people who would otherwise be coming here. So every single state, you have to go as far, far south as Delaware to find a state that doesn't do this. So, so we're an outlier, right? In Connecticut, at your Airbnb, you also paid um, uh, the state uh, state uh, room occupancy tax and, and likely a local, local option depending where you were. Um, I think that this is something that um, – Part of, the, part of the reason why uh, Airbnb and companies like Airbnb sort of add their gratuity on later is that people don't notice. Um, you know, I, I really find, you know, and especially for, you know, the argument that I hear that, oh, the person who's spending 5000 or $8,000 to rent a home for one week here in our communities is going to balk at paying a little more for that. I'm actually much more concerned about um, folks who are, of, of moderate income coming and vacationing here for, for two or three days uh, in our hotels and motels. Um, that's actually the consumer I'm much more concerned about. I'm not concerned. I, I think that folks who use um, 
I, I think the reason why Airbnb and others use this strategy is because people are not price sensitive to it. I think if the gratuity and, and the additional piece were there from a consumer behavior perspective, this is a, a company that's savvy enough and that frankly invests in studying human behavior that they wouldn't do it. Um, so the piece that I'm really concerned about is sort of the, the bread and butter traditional seasonal communities, you know, like a business that I grew up in, um, and how do we make sure we don't adversely impact them? Um, that's particularly important in a place like Yarmouth, where uh, you do have a number of rooms, and 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 the occupancy, um, the cost of occupancy is not as exorbitant uh, as it is uh, in other parts of you know of of, of, the, of the district. So point well taken, but I think this is something that um, Massachusetts is an outlier here, and we're, we're sort of late to the game uh, in doing something. Um, but I, I appreciate the concern. Um, and then you had mentioned economic development, which is a, which is a lengthy conversation. Um, certainly, I think we should be looking at planning for uh, the needs of our community. Uh, so that's uh, health care, uh, and, and particularly looking at how do you how do you increasingly with an aging population, how do you have really meaningful uh, care and services? How do you help keep people in their homes? Uh, I think value add products is a piece where we're seeing um, it's sort of another dynamic to the, sort of the tourism. Uh, seasonal economy, but it has a little more uh, legs as being sort of a year-round business. Uh, you look at the breweries that have emerged and some of the, the local products that are emerging. Um, you know, I think for, I, I would never say this in my neck of the woods, uh, but certainly for the Upper Cape and maybe the Middle Cape, uh, the Mid Cape uh, commuter rail is an option. Uh, if you were to extend commuter rail anywhere in the state, the cheapest place to extend commuter rail would be to Bourne. Um, that, I think, would make a big difference for folks who um, I'm, I'm actually appreciating how convenient it is to drive uh, from Barnstable to, to Yarmouth, for, I mean not Barnstable, from Boston to Yarmouth versus uh, from Boston to Truro. Um, I think that's a piece that, that, that is real. I think you see a community like Sandwich that's benefited from that. Um, and then, you know, I think the cost of health care for our businesses is a huge burden. Um, and I think something that we meaningfully, especially for our smaller businesses, um, and this is just a piece that you know, from a, from a wage perspective, from a whole host of other pieces, um, this is a real burden on, 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 on I think, on, on job development and also on the level of what the wages that can be paid. But uh, you, you asked a lot of questions, and I, I, I don't want to. I just do yeah. have one, uh, one uh, last comment on yep. the economic development. I, I, <clears throat> I think a lot of times people focus on, oh, well, you know, we need to try to attract uh, the, the need industries, the uh, – uh, the dot coms and all those kinds of everybody's going after those kinds of businesses. Everybody wants those in their backyard, but we, uh, as a region, have expertise in in uh, marine sciences and in uh, harvesting from the sea. Uh, it seems to me that economic economic development that is focused more on those kinds of strengths. Uh, would be things that would be a lot more palatable, certainly, mm -hmm. uh, for our area as opposed to trying to go out and spend dollars foolishly uh, and uh, on things that we don't have an expertise in. So if we can uh, get some support in that regard, finding uh, ways to develop those industries where we already have a strength and an interest, uh, I think we'll be much better off. Yeah, and, and, and I neglected to go into the benefits of, I think, the real emergence we've seen in aquaculture, uh, the work that's being done in the blue economy, um, you know, and, and actually the, the small business technical assistance grants that I was talking about earlier that we championed in the budget, those meaningfully directly impact the sort of, commu you know, small businesses that are, you know, you're, you're trying to get uh, an aquaculture uh, grant off the ground. Um, you know, these businesses, and, and I worked a lot on aquaculture issues uh, in my prior role, um, these have now become you know, everyone thinks of oysters and Wellfleet. Barnstable has the second highest number of, uh, of, of, of oysters uh, that are produced there. Um, these have turned into year-round, you know, year-round year activity. Um, and I think, you know, the value-add products, the, the things that are special from the Cape, you know, whether it's, whether it's oysters or whether it's, um, you know, chocolate or soap or, or, or whatever that, is, that kind of is, our expertise, um, you know, the marine work as well, uh, I think Woods Hole, you have Woods Hole and then you have the Province Center for Coastal Studies. Um, you know, Woods Hole, the, the question with Woods Hole is, you know, how do you, how do you, um, how do you incentivize some of this to bleed kind of further, further east? Um, but I think the point well taken. Eric. 
You sure you want your your first agenda as chairman is completely shot to hell? So you want? Me to <laughs> well, I was going to say. Um, um, it, Madam Chair, first of all, I'm not you used to politicians actually yet. answering questions, so we didn't expect it to be this long. <laughs> um, I'll try to keep it brief. First of all, thank you, gentlemen, very much for coming in. This is certainly been a mind-bending discussion so far, and I'll try not to make it any worse. I do want to remind Representative Whalen that tonight he's the second tallest person in the room. So. That's still the best looking. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you that. Um, early in the discussion, um, Senator Sear yep. made a comment about, um, you know, I think uh, Representative Whalen opened with some, uh, a mention of Chapter 70 reform. And Senator Sear, you followed up with a comment to the effect of that communities like Yarmouth are going to face significant challenges moving forward. You know, we have heard rumors of Chapter 70 reform on the horizon, and I was wondering if that you have any insight as to, and again, I don't want to, this is a topic for uh, all of these topics are, are, are you know, could be um, much broader discussions, but I'd like to ask and then follow up, do you, do you have any sense of what some of those reforms might be? I mean, do, do we have better times to look forward to, or? <laughs> so I think, um, me, I think from, from, from the dollar amount, I think if, if there's a glimmer of hope, uh, it's I think we expect that the pot of money for education to be expanded. So uh, it's very much likely that on the 2018 budget, uh, ballot, there's going to be a, a measure that essentially uh, taxes millionaires and billionaires at a, a slightly higher rate. Um, currently, right now, that polls at about 80 percent approval. Uh, that would generate about an additional two billion dollars in revenue. Um, you know, anything can happen in politics, but but sort of eighty percent support is a pretty um, pretty hefty number that we have right now. So I think th that that pot of money is going to be expanded. Um, what I'm what I'm less optimistic about is I think that if you look politically, um, and you looked at, at, at question two, uh, which is something that a number of education reformers and the governors and other had really got behind. Uh, and question two kind of failed so resoundingly that I think that uh, the sort of factions, the factions in education reform, um, I think the interests that, that prevailed uh, don't really feel an, an impetus or a need to, to necessarily go to the table. Uh, the Senate tried an education reform package um, actually last session. Uh, my predecessor was deeply involved in that. Um, and, and, and essentially, it was, it was dead on the arrival in the House. Um, I don't understand the exact politics why. Um, so from a, from a Chapter 70 reform perspective, I'm not, um, I'm not optimistic that uh, whatever that reform is going to be, if we even have that, that right now as we're positioned, that we're going to, uh, we're going to really be able to meaningfully uh, shift this or adjust this to benefit us. Right. And I think if anything, you know, there is always a chance when you open these things up, whether it's education reform, um, you know, we talk about uh, unaffordable housing, there's always conversation, you know, well, we could open up 40B and it could be so much worse, right? Uh, you know, we could open up chapter 70 and make it so much worse for our communities. And I think that that's a little, a little thing that I'm concerned about. So, so the good news is I think or, there's going to be more money if if, if, if uh, what we think is going to happen on the ballot happens with a constitutional amendment. Um, so I think, you know, that piece will be helpful. I think reform in, in just the current political dynamic that we have, um, if there's Chapter 70 reform, I don't think that our communities will, will be substantial winners in that, just, just in where we are politically. And I know that's not, maybe that's not a smart thing for me to say, but I, I, I think I think it would be Pollyannish to say, hey, we're going to go reform Chapter 70. And, you know, and Tim and I just, we, we don't have the votes and we don't have the ju juice to do it. And even if we did, I mean, even if, and Sarah Peake's pretty senior in the House and leadership, um, but I don't, even if a member of the CAPE delegation was the speaker, I don't know if we could change that formula to our advantage. And you know, I don't disagree that you know uh, our represent our delegation, our representation is so small. And when you look at these other communities that are getting some near 100% state funding, um, you know, More, yeah. it's difficult to believe that we will ever see an increase in, in any dollars that will have a substantial impact. I was just wondering, you know, what about a um, 
Uh, you know, just a, a change in, in, in the way we think about how school budgets are developed. I mean, we can't be the only the t only town or or or, mem or district member that faces challenges with school budgets. You know, I have to believe there are others similar to Yarmouth that face similar challenges. A and maybe we need, and again, this is, a t this is a topic for a much broader conversation, but maybe the way of thinking needs to change from how, d how do we as a community get the state to give us more money to how does the state encourage or restrain school budgets from coming up with these, you know, unsustainable increases? You know, we as a board of selectmen, um, you know, representatives of the voters and the stewards of the taxpayers' funds, we have restraints. We have two and a half percent tax increase that we build every single one of our budgets on every year. But the one department, if we recall the school district, a department, the one department that has unrestrained spending abilities is the department that devastates the town because it, it, it does not live by the same restraints that we as the Board of Selectmen, when, when building every other town budget, adhere to. You know, we, we know what we have. We can project the revenues that we will have out years in advance based on 2.5% in increases to annual taxes and, and you know, a, an estimated yearly growth. The one thing we can't budget for, and we do budget annually for a 2.5% increase over and above the prior year's assessment, we can't budget for 5% increases, 6%, 8% increases to school budgets. We, we have no way to plan for that, and it's always a scramble at the last minute when the numbers come in. We're, we're deciding <clears throat> where are we going to cut if we don't want to cut, whether or not we are going to support an override. And we live in the fear of if we don't support an override and the, we were to lose in a district meeting and we were to force that those cuts, where would they come from? So you know, we're really in a lose-lose situation when it comes to dealing with the school budget because it's, you know, it's, it's unsustainable from a, an ability for us to budget. And we are really powerless to do anything. You know, we, 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 I think the, the, the community of Yarmouth has gotten um, I'll say more receptive to the idea of overrides. We, we've passed a couple in the last couple of years. We've, we've sh shifted things around. We've passed technical overrides. But, you know, it's, it's a good solution. Fine. It, you know, it makes our job easier if the taxpayers want to allow, give, grant the schools an override. But at some point, it's going to become unsustainable because, you know, we don't want to be the suburbs of Connecticut or New Jersey with 20,000, you know, the, the one thing I always hear from people who move here is, you know, I, was, I had a 2,000 square foot house in New Jersey and I was paying $30,000 a year in taxes. Now I've got a 4,000 square foot house and I'm paying 5,000. Um, we don't want to be sure. that, <laughs> that high tax community. So the, uh, maybe we need, I, I mean, uh, that, 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 that's, a, that's a big way to come around and just say, maybe, maybe we need to change the way of thinking is how, from how do we generate more money to how do we restrain spending? You know, the, the spending is going to be done, obviously, when we're, when we're talking about it, the individual school districts. I believe there are 300, right around 300 individual school districts when you throw in the vocationals throughout the state. Uh, that That's a question that I just can't answer. Uh, it's like trying to find an idea, um, you know, in an individual head in a room full of 300 people. I, I, I wish I had the answer for you. If I did, um, not only would I be the best looking man in the room, Selectman Tolly, I would be the <laughs> smartest man in the room as well. And that's a great place to be. Uh, getting back to what uh, the Senator was speaking about earlier when we were talking about Chapter 70 reform, which you had brought up, Selectman Tolly, as well, um, and uh, thank you very much for that question, is I'm constantly counseled by people with a lot of legislative experience, a lot more than me being that I'm only in my third year in the legislature, is to be careful about foundation budget or, uh, or Chapter 70 um, 
modifications or reform because they might very well be to the detriment of the Cape and the Islands. And we can't afford to be, have any of this be at our detriment any further um, because we're already uh, at, the, at the bottom of the heap, so to speak, for wh what we get for percentages. We get, what, 16 percent, 16 and a half percent, somewhere around there. Um, that's inexcusable when I speak to friends of mine from other districts and they're, they're telling me that uh, 100 percent is not enough. 100% is not enough. It leaves me, sh I walk out of the room shaking my head. Um, is this real or is this a, a dream? Sometimes I, sw I swear it's a dream. Um, as we look at the millionaire tax, which is gonna be coming up, um, you know, I, I, I share uh, some concerns with this uh, going forward in that they're projecting right now that this will bring in between 1.2 and 1.6 billion dollars in added revenue in the state between 1.2 and 1.6 billion. The only problem with it is there are about six or seven different groups that are lined up that already think you know, a large portion, if not all of that money, is gonna go to, go to them. The transportation industry, speak to the construction trades, and they're gonna tell you that, that all that money is gonna go for uh, rail expansion, it's gonna go for the Green Line extension in Boston, it's gonna build South Coast Rail, and it's gonna fix all the bridges and roads in Massachusetts. You speak to people in uh, public schools, um, or, or in, the, you know, uh, in, in the school field, the education field, well now it splits one of two different ways. It's gonna be either more chapter 70 funding for the schools in general, either that or we're gonna take the money, we're gonna use it to fund universal pre-K. Universal pre-K has been amortized out as being $1.25 billion would be the cost of that. So there it evaporates yet again. Public safety is looking at using it as well as so many other different very worthy interests across the state. So we've taken that 1.2 to 1.6 billion dollars and we've spent it already about five times. Um, I would just be careful in, you know, as, as we advance going forward looking at this and saying once we get this thing through it's gonna solve all of our chapter 70 funding issues here on the Cape because because it's not, because a lot of it's gonna be diverted to the, um, the usual places where they are, you know, um, the, the, the urban um, places around the Commonwealth with um, a higher representative, a uh, higher number of representatives for their area. And then, um, I don't know, I'm just getting kind of frustrated thinking about all that being spent 17 different ways. Let's just be very, very careful um, looking forward to this. Let's be careful about looking forward to some sort of Chapter 70 reform. Right now, it's, it may not be untenable, but you know, it, it's not gonna be sustainable for a very long period of time. Um, but I, I, I kind of a little more comfortable for the time being where we are in just trying to find those little pots of extra money that we can to deliver to the school districts. And also, as you're bringing up um, uh, Selectman Tolley, trying to find those efficiencies wherever we can within our individual school districts because we certainly need some relief for the taxpayer. I, you know, if I may, I would just say, I think it's really important though that our, I think at some point, whether it's in, a next term or in you know in, in future years in the next decade there'll be a window of opportunity that I'll come up with chapter 70 and I think that from a, a political organizing perspective um, you know I think if we found out tomorrow which this is actually possible given the current environment that uh, the speaker and the Senate president made an agreement and they're gonna move on chapter 70 and we're gonna take up a bill before the July 31st break um, I, 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 I we I don't think we could mobilize in a way to be a effective. Um, and, and so I think that that's a piece that I think is important. Um, and, and I think that also part of that conversation too, um, I think can really help us understand and look at what our schools do. Um, and you know, I, I think talk about, I think the really incredibly valuable work and commitment that we have um, as a society, as a commonwealth, you know, this is the, the first place of public education. Um, you know, we, we, we have to do that responsibly, but I think that, um, you know, this is the best, we know that this is, the public education is, is the best investment we can make, um, you know, in our children. And I think this is something that um, we all share as a value, and I think that's something we should, you know, celebrate. I mean, you're doing it responsibly, but I, I think that I, more of that coal, I think more of that coalition political work, I think, um, and in celebration of our schools would position our communities better for when that window of opportunity comes, whether it's in two years, 
or you know further down the road um, you know that's something I think would certainly help uh, Tim and I do a better job in, in, in making a case for, for our communities Eric no that's you're all set. I have a lot of notes here. One of the things I want to say about education is, um, you know, New York and there's a lot of other places that have separate taxing authorities for um, raising appropriation. And that, you know, if we stay in the district, it may be something that we may be asking for, um, you know, help on. Um, and, you know, I think a lot of statistics show that uh, universal pre-K, the data is there to prove it's um, significant impact. Um, unfortunately, everything that we talk about is so significant and so important and yet so expensive. So um, a couple of things, um, you know, a lot of the discussion with economic development, housing, um, I do think that wastewater um, is a pinnacle point for us here in terms of creating a year-round economy and having um, the development that we need. Uh, so I'm looking forward to watching that process go forward. We've asked for help from the state, so this is the first um, real piece that we may see to help um, the taxpayers here and not be a burden on the taxes. We talked about other things as a community in terms of thinking out of the box of how we're going to fund it. Um, one of the things I spoke to you about, um, Julian, at one of the breakfast meetings was um, the CPA mm. and the potential for um, changing the uh, legislation to allow wastewater to be a piece of that. You know, that's something each community could do. Some, some would want it, um, some w wouldn't. One of the other things that the staff came up with um, in terms of um, thinking of ways to do it without burdening the taxpayers is a fee and a transfer for the registry of deeds. Um, The drug issue is significant, and Mike's correct. Um, it's not going in the direction that we, we want. And I, I do believe that we need more front loading in terms of um, prevention. It is so frustrating to watch the programs that got put in and then get taken out. I mean, if we can't count on a partnership from the state on something that is so significant, it's very depressing. We have no. Um, stability really in in planning and, and I'm not I'm not blaming you I'm just talking about the climate I mean it's the same thing with the state when you look at our roads uh, I have more people complain about route 28 and even the highway um, which leads me to another question um, Suzanne was here earlier from um, the assembly and she was talking about route 6 and they need some help getting um, the federal government to allow for a lease. I'm not sure if the legislators can yep. can collectively help with with um, trying to lobby the federal government to get some relief with that. That's, that's something the delegation is um, working on. Uh, I very much have no problem with and support having, I mean, it, it's an embarrassment. Um, I think the current services that we have at, at most of our visitor center and rest areas um, so I think we're, that's something the delegation, I mean, I think obviously can't, uh, we can't work magic for summer 2017, um, but actually uh, I traveled to D.C. as part of a delegation uh, from the Senate, and we actually met with uh, the Department of Transportation uh, and have a contact there, and so this is an issue, you know, we've raised. Um, so I think something we're, we're, we're committed to working on, uh, again, hope the, the fix hopefully being uh, some way to pull something together. Um, that's meaningful for, for 2018. Great. Yes. No, it's on the radar for the future. We've got a Band-Aid, but, you know, yep. like everything else. And also working with the county as well. And in terms of the drugs, you know, I, I, and I've, I've said this before, and I think I even said it to um, Mara Healy at one of the MMA meetings, you know, they did a great job with, with um, the prescription drug uh, registration and, and their analysis of doing that. I feel strongly that... Um, somebody needs to do an analysis of our courts and our judges because we spend a significant amount of resources putting dealers in jail for them to be let out. And, um, you know, that is really um, a smack in the face to our public safety people who are doing a great job. And there is a significant difference, in my opinion, between a user and a dealer. And we're not um, taking that seriously at all in our judicial system. And I wish that the state would take a look at um, 
mandating higher um, or more stringent penalties upon dealers because what's happening out there is it's a joke to them. It's a real joke, and I really feel bad for our police officers who are, are, are doing yeoman's work and trying to curb uh, the issue, and the next day they're back on the street. Madam Chair, you're certainly speaking to the choir on I this know. one. Um, over the course of my career, I participated in arrests of narcotic traffickers uh, on Route 84 in Sturbridge several times, multi-kilo quantities of uh, cocaine. And um, bail was set, and someone comes in and pays fifty thousand and forty dollars cash bail, and then they leave the country. Mm. So no one is, uh, believe me, as, as as I said, you're definitely preaching to the choir on this. Um, certainly, uh, it's something that, that that we're cognizant of, and I think as much sunlight, because sunlight being the best disinfectant in, in, in any problem, as much sunlight as the media can um, uh, bring to this issue. Uh, the better off we all are as a society. Um, the only thing is the judiciary does remain its own independent body under the separation of powers and right, legislature and they stay has, forever. I'm and sorry? They, and they're there forever, regardless. And uh, if the state doesn't step in and do an analysis of the judges who are doing their jobs and who aren't, uh, I'm sorry, we're never gonna, we're not gonna, we're not gonna really make the commitment to, to fixing the issue. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> that's that's my opinion. In terms of the blue economy, um, there is a group on the Cape. Um, they came to one of uh, the Cape and Island Selectman meetings, and I've asked them, Norm, to um, start. They're in they're in a I think blue that institute. They're, the, yeah. Yep. So they're working on uh, a first phase of looking at what the opportunities are for the blue economy, and at some point, hopefully, we'll have them in if they get their grant extended. I just have to say. That. Madam Chairman, I'm on the steering committee. I'd be happy to yeah, help I talked facilitate to Bert. that. Bert Good. was there, and he's 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 wor working to take a show on the road. So, um, our delegation really collaborates so well. Um, I see you guys everywhere. You work so hard, and we're we're really really fortunate. When we first talked about having this meeting, um, my thought was that every year we do our goals and. Um, we identify, you know, what I wanted to do was kind of identify where our barriers were with the state. Um, unfortunately, you guys came before our goals for this year were complete. But what I would like to do to is once, once we work through that, hopefully we can get, you know, maybe highlight some areas of which that we can really um, use. I'd like to kind of go through it and speak as one voice where, where we could really use your help. So I hope that you'd be open to um, allowing staff to make sure that you get those goals and see the, the areas where it shakes out, where where we can um, work with you in, in, in you, accomplishing some things. Madam Chair, you've seen how long two politicians in front of you have drawn out this uh, period of time. <laughs> when the third politician, when Rep Crocker is with us, uh. um, then uh, you may want to consider having this like town meeting on a Saturday morning over at Mattakees <laughs> because it will be well after midnight by the time we're all done. Well, I think you know once we get them written um, and we can really identify kind of the barriers that we really need help with the state um, on achieving those things and at least make you aware of them. I know a lot of them you work on. We've talked about a lot of things tonight. Um, uh, Madam Chair, I think that I love that suggestion and I think um, you know, also to you know your, your staff and and with Dan and his staff working with our staffs as well to look at this and and what what I think you'll find is some of the barriers right are, are these really big issues that we've been talking about, um, but there also might be some others that that we can do some quick work on, um, and that so when we would come back not only just in responding and saying you know yes we hear these goals we have all this work to do, um, but maybe also trying to find some progress on some small areas and uh, again you're fortunate because uh, your new town manager. Uh, also knows how to navigate um, quite well uh, in that environment. So it's looking forward to having that and, and getting some solutions, at least some small ones. Uh, Got to work on Chapter 70 a little more. But yeah, well, we know we understand that your hands are tied. We know that um, you're up against the numbers, and and we appreciate all the work that you do. Does anybody else have anything? There's one comment um, on the Foundation Budget Review Commission study, which I think you alluded to, that was the report was filed in late October of 2015. Um, I'm assuming that the legislature is going to use that, at least from a starting point, when they consider any changes to Chapter 70 formulas, because there was broad-based representation on that commission from school committees and, and um, superintendents, um, 
members of the public, members of the Senate, members of the legislature, and so forth. Um, but what, what they found, and why I don't, I don't think there's a, a pot of gold at the end of this rainbow, I, I, I don't think they're going to do anything that's specific to a community like Cape Cod. But rather, they're looking at the entire foundation budget concept. And um, what the study indicates is that they're underfunded in, in specific areas, in particular in terms of health insurance and special education. ELL and low-income students, that seems to be. There's a redefinition recently, uh, uh, Selectman, of um, low-income students um, that, that was uh, done recently by DESE, and that was kind of the source of the problem where you saw in the news recently with the, the city of Brockton having a, uh, I think it was a multi-million dollar, uh, multi dollar shortfall at the end of the year and uh, having to lay off a number of staff. So there have been a number of changes in, in, in addition to that. A number of, number of proposals that came up in that um, Selectman Stone um, were incorporated into, it's kind of an omnibus piece of legislation. It was put forth by Senator Chang Diaz, um, and Senator Chang Diaz, I believe, is the, uh, she's the yep. uh, Senate Chair of the uh, uh, Joint Committee on Education. So a, a lot of that was folded into her legislation. Some of it was folded into other um, pieces of legislation, also filed by Chairwoman Peich, um, she's a representative from Wellesley, um, who's uh, the House Chair, um, and um, also uh, Rep. Kim Ferguson, the ranking member on the House side for education, filed some. So it's kind of piecemeal dropped into pieces of legislation, and we'll see what portions of that get through. But again, they also bear strong, close examination um, from the bottom up to make sure that um, some of these uh, uh, some of these pieces of legislation don't in turn end up being detrimental to the funding issues that we already face here uh, on Cape Cod and the islands. They also mentioned in terms of you know significant um, deficit areas, uh, employee benefits and fixed charges. Um, they said are underfunded by 140 percent in that study, and um, you know we got retiree health insurance issues that aren't accounted for either. But the, um, the projections in terms of uh, bringing that funding up to snuff are, are very, very large numbers. Um, and, and, and in a one-year shot, it's something like $500 million. And then they have the numbers broken down over over four years, which are about 25% of that per year. And in view of the deficits that the state's facing right now, I don't, I don't know how they would come close to accomplishing the, the um, observations of the commission in terms of redoing the Chapter 70 formula yeah. along those lines. As, as we were discussing, sir, yeah, they're, they're, uh, that, that's going to be one of the interests that's going to be looking for money coming up we have. As I said, the universal pre-K, uh, pre we have the people that want um, free community college for everybody. That's been amortized out at a minimum of $600 million as well. Transportation needs, yes, you're absolutely right, um, Selectman Stone. The challenges we have ahead of us are, v are very many, and um, we're going to have to find a way to navigate them. And the other think piece for the ride home is <laughs> when you start taxing the millionaires, how long do you think they're going to stay here? So actually, um, Minnesota uh, is a really is, is an interesting case study uh, on this. Minnesota enacted uh, a fair share amendment, uh, I think, four or five years ago, um, and actually saw no adverse uh, departures. Um, no, they're actually unemployed. You, um, Minnesota and and, and uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin make great case studies right now. Um, so uh, Minnesota implemented uh, implemented this and a number of other policies. Um, pretty low unemployment, their economy is doing very well. Uh, Wisconsin, um, which sort of took a, the opposite tact, uh, has very high unemployment. Um, its economy is not doing as well. I mean, you, there's sort of a, a, a theoretical debate on this. I, I think, you know, my interest here is, or our interest here is just saying this is something that's coming up and going before the voters. Um, the percentage of support in it is likely high, uh, or is, is currently high now. So I think it's something that, from a planning perspective, the town should expect. If you look at the ballot initiative, um, it does specifically earmark the language around education. Of course, um, the legislature has a way of, of changing that. Uh, and so I think I think Representative Whalen's point that, that that a lot of people are looking at these dollars is 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 true. Um, you know, but I think that from a 
uh, resource perspective, I think this is sort of the biggest biggest thing that's likely coming down the pike. Um, you know, I still don't understand why, you know, broadly our economy in Massachusetts is doing very well. Um, we are booming in Greater Boston, um, and it 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 it. It is odd, and, and, and a lot of people don't know. You know, the chairs of Ways and Means don't know. The revenue, the commissioner of revenue doesn't know why sort of our revenues in a time where broadly the state's doing well. Um, I think actually if you talk to some analysis, they would say we're sort of overdue for a recession, um, but we're not yet seeing that, and, and, and the revenues are flat or, or, or depleting. So it, it's very much of a conundrum where there, where there isn't con kind of consensus on it. Um, you know, I, I think we'll see what the voters decide in 2018. Um, but I think that is something that I want to make sure you folks are aware of, you know, from a planning perspective. Um. You know, you know um, we have to wrap this up. Pe people uh, decide ultimately on their own what they think is a fair taxation system, and they find ways. In our, in our economy, uh, they find ways to uh, address what they feel are unfair taxation systems. So, so you know, I, I don't know if there's three, three millionaires or billionaires in, in, in Wisconsin and, and, and uh, <laughs> Minnesota. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what the sample size is there, but I'm not sure I would draw on that as being representative. Uh, if, if you come to Massachusetts and New York, you may get a different picture on that uh, as to and you might find uh, that people are a little craftier in, in determining ways that, uh, to uh, uh, create a fair system of their own. So I can hook them. I'll offer that uh, I think that there hasn't, the reason why the millionaires haven't left uh, Minnesota is because the roads are still closed because of the winter weather. <laughs> <laughs> and they have that great health care. <laughs> thank you both very much for coming. Thank you. I really appreciate You've the been time. been very kind. Thank you for thank the opportunity you. to speak to you and to the residents here in the town of Yarmouth. You've been exceptionally kind. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the very generous time. Thank you. You're welcome. Good stuff. Okay, I want to turn it over to... Um, Mr. Stone for the uh, public hearings. I apologize to everybody for the delay.